The speaker that I bring to you is a man that I have loved and admired for over 50 years. We've worked together. We've been in camps together. We've preached together. We've traveled together. We started Texas Bible College together. He and I put in the resolution for it, and uh, we're here together today. It's nothing but fitting and appropriate that J.T. Pugh would come to this pulpit and preach right from his heart. Now let me tell you, this man has blessed our entire fellowship. He's not a politician. He's held political offices, but never has he been a politician. J.T. Pugh's always the same when you see him. He's not hard. He's the, one of the most well-balanced men that we have in Pentecost. I'd hate to know what it'd be like to have a United Pentecostal Church without J.T. Pugh. Right. Let's welcome him. Praise God, folks. Let's give God glory. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. 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 Glory. 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 Jesus, we praise you. We praise you. We praise you. Glory to your precious name. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Remain standing just a moment. I was cleaning out my Bible this morning, and I uh, <clears throat> noticed a scribbling there on a couple of sheets of paper, and then I recognized it was something I had written down two weeks ago. I wrote it down as I was praying alone in the prayer room, and uh, there came to me a tremendous, tremendous spiritual impression, and I just wanted to... Uh, share what I wrote on the paper. In the next time frame of the next 10 years, including now, there will be scores of preachers in the United Pentecostal Church who will be called upon to make the most momentous decision of their entire lives. The direction of the United Pentecostal Church everlastingly will depend upon whether Again, that we have men like Abraham who will go out not knowing. Men like Moses who will despise the riches of Egypt. Men as David who will discern that the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart. Men as Paul who claim nothing and yet possess all things. This daring venture will not be aside from doctrine and from true commitment. This escalation, this migration will affect the religious world in the next 10 years. I'm overwhelmed by this moment. I'm overwhelmed by this place. I am overwhelmed by the tremendous energetic movement of God's purpose that is flowing right now in the world. Out of the 500 million people who it is claimed speak with tongues in the world today, they will very soon, within the con I feel like quite soon, confront all over again the Godhead issue. They will do that. And I am speaking to young men today that <clears throat> you will be a part of a, a, tremendous, uh, a tremendous movement. I heard uh, uh, Bill uh, Gothard say, what, 20 years ago, we have not had true religious revival in a long time because there has not been introduced a new doctrinal revelation. He said, with every true revival, there comes an additional revelation of truth. And he said, we have not had that since the days of Martin Luther. It is now. Yes. Praise God. Yes. It is now. Yes. Glory. Praise God. I want to speak today to uh, the person that has, as myself, been flattened by what we have already 
uh, felt here and heard here and have felt deep within themselves a certain inadequacy because that you're so well acquainted with yourself. And uh, I, I want to speak to you. I want to speak to that young man that faces the future today with perhaps some type of insecurity, but you want to get a hold of it, and uh, you're ready. Your permission has already been committed, but uh, the how is something I want to speak today to that preacher that has come here to this conference and in some way lost your way. And you have not been in the beat and the rhythm of it. You once have been and you knew what the pulse was. But you have not felt the pulse for a while and you would like to feel it. Praise God. I'd like to speak to my young friend that I've already spoken to who his marriage is in is in, in problems. I want to speak what the wise men spoke so long ago. While you're still standing, we read from 1 Kings chapter 3, beginning with verse 5. In Gibeon, the Lord appeared unto Solomon in a dream by night and said, and God said, Ask what you will, I will give thee. And Solomon said, Thou hast shown unto thy servant David, my father, great mercy, according as he walked before thee in truth and in righteousness and in uprightness of heart with thee. And thou hast kept for him this great kindness that thou hast given him a son to sit on his throne as it is this day. And now, O Lord my God, thou hast made thy servant king instead of David, my father, but, and I come to thee, resident weakness perhaps it's felt in some. I am but a little child. I know not how to go out or to come in. Give thy servant an understanding heart to judge thy people that I may discern between good and bad. For who is able to judge so great a people? And then <clears throat> many years later, 37 years later, the conclusion of the man who wanted to know how to go out and come in is this. Ecclesiastes chapter 11, verse 1. Cast thy bread upon the water, for thou shalt find it after many days. Give a portion to seven and also to eight, for thou knowest not what evil shall be upon the earth. If the clouds be full of rain, they shall empty themselves upon the earth. And if the tree fall toward the south or toward the north, in the place where the tree falleth, there it shall be. He that observeth the wind shall not sow, and he that regardeth the cloud shall not reap. As thou knowest not what is the way of the Spirit, nor how the bones do grow in the womb of her that it was child, even so thou knowest not the works of God who maketh all. So, in the morning sow thy seed, in the evening withhold not thy hand, for thou knowest not whether it shall prosper either this or that, or whether they both shall alike be good. You may be seated. Praise God. I want to speak about the divine flow. The divine flow. <clears throat> and such is in the world today. It certainly is. Solomon had waited through 37 years of sensuality, 37 years of egotism, 37 years of greed, and <clears throat> the struggle for power. After 37 years, if somebody asked him, and perhaps they did, sum up for us shortly, what is the true wisdom of life? And then he gave this particular statement here, which we use uh, for our text. Cast your bread upon the water. And it shall return to you after many days. You need to give a trusting release of your life to God, he is saying. There is a flow of God's divine energy and purpose in the world. Invisible, unseen, certain and sure. The person that never feels that, that never picks up on it, that never senses it, of course, they never come to the realization of their potential that they could. But Romans chapter 8 verse 2 called it the law of the spirit of life. 
that it was there and that it did work, that it had a certain life and energy and beat to it, and you, you had it, and when you had it, it could expel the sickness that came into the body or into your own life. It would uh, ex exude from you those things that would be debilitating. And Jesus himself spoke of that particular flow. And he said, A person that believed upon me, as the scripture has said, out of his innermost being shall flow rivers of living water. There is a divine flow. It is in the universe today. It is in this world. It is surging forward. It has moved so drastically and energetically for the last 45 years. And now, as I've already stated, we are coming to a time when it shall bear upon its stalwart shoulders the absoluteness of truth itself. We are in the midst of something I don't think that we can comprehend. It is so great and mighty, and it is only, only the beginning. The wise man is telling us here that our lives should be invested in our human relationships and and to serve people. Bread is a type of life. And of course water is a type of people. Invest your life into people, he is saying. Put it there and trust it. To that person that may feel like that, I don't have that capability. I appreciate the stalwart people that I observe here. I am awed by what I have heard here. But I pastor a church such and such size and this and that, and I've never been there in whatever. The Holy Spirit, it seems to me right now, is coming forcibly to somebody, my friend, to tell them to stand on your feet and I will be with you. If you will trust me in those things that you cannot yet understand, if you will trust me in those things that you are yet insecure in and uncertain in, and do what you can do, I will be with you. Cast your bread upon the flow. Cast your bread into the surge. Praise God. Believe me for the rest, and I will be with you. I feel strongly that God is telling people that. Success or failure depends upon the, our relationship with people. For a person to fail scholastically is embarrassing. To fail uh, in money matters is devastating. To fail in your life, it would be a terrible thing. But to fail in your relationship is to fail in your life. It certainly is, because everything goes down there when that relationship is not right. We are certainly in agreement with what our Ethiopian brethren say and Brother Teclamerin has said, that the secret is in unity, for there is that, again, that invisible energy, that unseen surge, that bonding, the absence of insecurity, the feeling that all is well and that God is with us. The Bible teaches us that. Ephesians 4 and 3 said, Endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. The unity of the Spirit is not the unity of a program. Unity of the Spirit is not the unity of a project. The unity of the Spirit, my friend, is something that is able to bear and to forbear. That is able to reach across. The New Testament church did not have unity of its doctrine. Never did. It did not have unity of many things. But one thing Paul knew that they could have, and that was the unity of the Spirit. And they reached for that. I remember so well, Sister Tinney, the uh, prayer meeting in St. Louis, uh, the network of prayer. And we came, and the way that it was so well put together and organized, it was hours and hours of prayer. And of course it was done in different ways. Well, first it was, uh, we came in the posture of just another meeting. But as we prayed, as we prayed, uh, subtly and uh, almost unknowingly, there was something that broke and something that vanished away. And the first thing I knew, I was looking at other people differently. 
And as I met them, I met them differently. And there was something that came among us. And there was a bonding. And there was a strength. And there was a power. And there was a flow. And there was an energy. Praise God. I am talking about something here today, friend. To that person that may know something about fear and timidity and what not. God is in this world. And God's work is in this world. And God's movement is here. To that person who has clean hands and a pure heart. And who will trust it to God. God will bear you up. And you can be productive in Him. Praise God. Hallelujah. Yeah. Our ladies auxiliary from Texaco District. Our ladies auxiliary leader was present in that St. Louis meeting and she was so overwhelmed and caught up with prayer. So she came back to Texaco District and soon after, a couple of weeks after we had our Texaco count meeting, I've never been in a count meeting just like it. We've had our problems there in the district. There's been the various things and, and uh, but, but this dear lady, she organized prayer and we prayed. And there were hours of prayer. And as it got going, there was praying all night long. And uh, there was seeking God. And then there was a praying before church. And it was well uh, prepared for. And the people who led it, uh, they, they had sought God and prepared themselves. And it wasn't just a, a structured situation, but it was a powerful something that involved everybody. And folks that customarily would come early to sit up on their pews and observe and to make their particular observations and, and to look the crowd over found themselves surrounded by praying people, marching people, shouting people, weeping people, crying people until the place was drowned in something and in movement and something broke and there was bonding and there was love and, and there was a surge. And so the wise men said there's a river that makes glad the city of God. Praise the Lord. And again he said, cast your bread upon that and it shall return to you after many days. It will happen. There is a tremendous flow in this world today that sweeps everything before it. Last summer I was in San Francisco for most of the week, and I was with a group of people that do nothing but to uh, probe the future. They were call themselves a future society, and they're from across the world, and <clears throat> very, very brainy people. When they begin to list the forces and the ten particular forces that have changing culture in the world, and they begin to flash them up there, one, two, and three, and come on down, I was surprised this non-religious group that included there the emergence of the Pentecostals as something that has been a fact in world movement. Into that particular group I am saying again that there will come an emergence of this truth that Jehovah God indeed did become my salvation. Praise God. I believe that with all my heart. I do not think that you can count on separation and commitment from people who believe in the Trinity. It takes people who believe that God Almighty did indeed die for me. Praise God. And I would say all over again, if He did indeed die for me, I owe Him everything. Praise God. And He did die for me in flesh. Praise the Lord. And that's going to be one of the great factors, I think, and is one of the great factors of what God is doing in the earth today. Isaiah 66 and 12 said, I will extend peace unto her like a river, and the glory of the Gentiles shall be like a flowing stream. Praise God. David said, The blessed man is the man that sitteth not in the, in the seat of the scornful, nor standeth in the way of the sinner, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law doth he meditate day and night. And he should be like the tree that is planted by the river of the living water. God wants us, everyone, to trust it 
to His program and to trust it to what He is doing and trust it to the energy that is flowing in the world today. I have seen that happen in the lives of people. When I was superintendent of the Texaco District, I saw something happen to a couple of fellows on our district board. Uh, these two men, and I'll just name one here. His name's Bill Ford. Bill Ford worked in the oil field. He, uh, he had quite a few men under him, and he was a very intelligent man. He was a good leader, and for part of his life, he was, uh, he was a, a man that used God's name in vain. He, he was a sinner. But in time, Bill Ford came to God, and shortly thereafter, he surrendered his life to preach the gospel. When he came to preach the gospel, he went to a little town up north of us by the name of Level Land, and God used him there, and the church grew, and things were going fine. But there was turbulence also, and there was problems, and, and uh, he, 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 he was into that. So when I came on the board, I was facing a man here that was a strong man physically, a man also of strong will, and, uh, but he was honest. And as we worked together, something about what we were trying to do and so on, Bill Ford, he, he caught a hold of something. Hey! It would be so great if somehow or other that just now somebody could get hold of a particular insight and to say, I'll do that. I'm going to trust it to God. I believe it will work and it is working. And I'm just going to ride that surge and that energy. I'm going to do what I can do. I'll be like the lad that gave the loaves and the fishes. I'll be like Moses who cast his rod upon the ground. I'll give what I've got to give. Praise God. I'll do it with all my heart. Bill Ford began to seek God. As David said, the sacrifices of God are broken spirit and a broken contrite heart. And he got up before our camp. He was supposed to preach. And he rose with his Bible in a trembling hands, his big huge hands. And he was weeping. He confessed to the camp and to the people. And he said, I'm seeking God. I want my heart to be open to God, and etc. And a couple of weeks I went by to see him went to his house, and his wife said, Brother Pugh, Bill's over at the church. So I drove over to the church. I've been in there quite a few times, and I knew what the layout was. Walked into the darkened auditorium, no light on, and I heard someone praying. All preachers should have, and I suppose do have a place somewhere in the church that they love to pray in. Should have a place at their house, and I suppose they do where they left to pray at home, if they're going to pray at home. Praise God. And so I stepped in the back and I saw that this pastor's place is on the platform. And he had his handkerchief out. He was crying and he was walking up and down on the platform. And he was seeking God. That was nothing that I was supposed to listen to. I felt so subdued. I dropped on my knees at the back bench and I began to pray. And in time, he, he sensed that somebody else was in the building. and So he came uh, groping back, and he saw me kneeling there. And, and he laid his hand on me, so let's go back in the office, get something to drink. And we stepped in the office, and he still had his handkerchief out, handed me a Coke, and he dropped down in the seat beside it, behind his desk. And he burst out with these words. He said, I've made the biggest mess of my life. And um, I said, what do you mean? Well, this, he said, you see what this is? And he held up a sheet of paper with a long list of names on it. I said, what's that? He said, it's a list of people that I have run over. It's a list of people that, that I have had problems with. And uh, he said, um, I have been spending this week calling them. And I've been asking their forgiveness and so on. He said, my problem, Brother Pew, is that I spent my time defending my rights. And uh, my turf and holding on to this, and holding on to that, and so on. And he said, I've come to the place that I want to let it go. I want to trust it to God. <laughs> and 
sweet soul of that person that loves God today. Sure, you love it. You love His Word. But there's been so much energy bled off into holding on and to defending your rights. And, and so and you're not going to run over me. You know, uh, uh, and so he said, I'm going to release it. It wasn't too long after that until cancer was discovered in my brother's sinus. And Bill Ford went to meet God and he went to meet Him in peace. He cast it into the stream. He trusted it to God. There is something that is flowing. There is something that is moving. There is something that is in the world. It has the energy in itself to take care of any problem that you may have, friend. Trust it to God. Praise God. Trust it to God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Yeah, let it flow. Let it flow. Praise God. You're not going to fix it yourself anyway. You're not going to do it. Just do the work of God. Praise God. Cast your bread upon the water. Praise God. Hallelujah. Amen. The wise man is telling us that our lives should be lived in trusting release. He said, do that. Invest in the flow. Water weighs 1,264 pounds per cubic yard. Only one cubic yard of water will weigh 1,264 pounds. When that much weight begins to flow, it, is, it doesn't matter if it's still, but if there's movement. And there is movement! Praise God! There's nothing can stand before it. It's the most powerful energy that there is. Praise God. The Lord is saying, realize that. Depend upon that. Relax in that. That God's will will be done. I'd like for us to stretch our hands to God and, and to say the first words of the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be Thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. And it is coming. And it is being done. Woo! Yes, Glory! 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 Praise God. The universe itself is a vast energy field. It's an energy factory. And... The whole world is, is filled with it. This particular pulpit right here that I touch seems so solid as I touch it with my hand. Yet I could look at it through particular glasses and I could see it as a whirling mass of energy. Everything is in movement. To that person today, friend, that you're trying to anchor something and keep it and stop it. Amen right now. No, you've got to trust it to God. Amen. Everything moves. Everything goes. You cannot peg it down. You cannot arrest it. Hold to it loosely. Praise God. And trust it to God. Hallelujah. Glory. Praise God. Praise God. Last summer I was talking to Dr. W.G. Wickham who heads the, the chemical department the, the, uh, of um, Montana University. And so we were just talking about uh, some things of science. And I said to him, Dr. Wickham, how is it that a particle on one side of our solar system responds and does respond to a particle on the opposite side of our solar system? And, and they do it in a flash. And... Uh, why, how do they communicate? Uh, it is even faster than the speed of light that uh, that communication goes. He simply smiled to me. He said, well, he said, Reverend, there's, a, uh, there's just the, the divine intelligence that is in the universe. Praise God. That God is there. 
to that person that might feel weak, that might feel timid, who you come to places like this and you see and you hear and you're just bowled over and flattened and you feel intimidated somehow or another. My friend, trust it to God. Do what you can do. Praise God. Hallelujah. Cast your bread on the water. Let it flow. Praise God. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Go with it. Praise God. Universe. The derivative of it, of course, is one song. Una is one. Verse song. One song. It moves in its proper sequence, in its proper beat. God has His purpose in it. If a person sits here today and you feel like that your life is all out of whack and chaos, there can be purpose and there is purpose in all that God does. Yes, it is. Amen. Let it go. We don't own nothing. You never will own anything. The car that you're driving now, somebody else will hold the title to it quite soon. The property that the richest man in your particular town has, and all he has, somebody else will be holding the deed to his property. All that we see passes through our life briefly. We have it for a little time, and then it goes on. You'll never hold it. You'll never own it. Praise God. We're here just for a time. Praise God. Let it flow. Praise the Lord. Relax in God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Woo! Glory. Major problems of life come about people trying to claim rights, trying to claim things, and trying to hold on to them, and to rest the things that flow into their life. And when they do, they, when they try to stop it, the other things that would come in back up and don't get there. Some of those things are better than what they're trying to hold on to. But they damn it up and it never flows through their life. Praise God. Hallelujah. Oh, let's pray the first part of the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be Thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. Yeah. Praise God. Praise God. It's going to be all right. It's going to be all right. Glory to God. It's going to be all right. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. In industry, even industry itself has come to the place where they know that that's true. And they, they say, if we can have a certain number of men who will come can come to a flow state. What do they mean? A certain mem member of employees or executives that comes to a flow state. They're talking about a, a time that they have great intuition, that they project themselves uh, beyond cold logic, that they begin to sense things and so on. Even industry itself feels that. A United Pentecostal Church young man that had very little college and uh, I talked to him not long ago. He was talking to me about the president of Traveler's Insurance taking him out to dinner. And this young man, uh, not very much corporate experience, but he has that flow state. He lives beyond that which can be touched. I'm talking to a preacher right now that it's all got to be cold logic as far as you're concerned. And you got to be able to put your hand on it. It's not that way, friend. Praise God. Praise God. Oh, hallelujah. To trust it to God. Thank you, Jesus. To trust it to God. Trust it to God. Yeah. Hallelujah. And so the president of, <clears throat> of Travelers said, we want you with us. Uh, what do you want to do? Tell us what you want to do. We'll put you where you can do that. If there's no place that we're doing that, we'll create a place where for you, just for you. That you what, why did he want him there? Because here was a guy that lived beyond what you could touch, what you could, what you could the, the logic. He had the intuition. He had the sense. He had the feeling. Praise God. Praise God. We're feeling a lot of that around here. Praise God. And it's true. And it is absolutely true. Jesus said, 
freely you have received. And he said this to 70 that he was fixing to send out. And he said, How, what should we do if we're going to be a success out there and we're going to leave you and we're going to be on our own? This is what he said. He said, freely you have received, freely give. Let it pass through you. Praise God. You've heard this. Don't try to capture it. Don't claim it. Don't put your name on it. Praise God. Let it flow through. Praise God. Let it flow. Glory. Glory. Thank you, Jesus. 2 Corinthians uh, the 6th chapter, verse 10. The Apostle Paul said, this ought to be our attitude. Having... Nothing, yet possessing all things, thank God. Because it will come through. It will be there. Hallelujah. Woo! Glory. Philippians 4 and 11. Paul said, I've learned that whatsoever state I'm in, therewith to be content. I relax in the matter. I am in the will of God. It's going to work out. God will do it. Praise God. And he said to some factional people in the church at Corinth, he said, what are you fussing about? He said, all things are yours. Amen. They belong to you. It will come to you. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. It's a wonderful thing when the presence of God flows through our life. Wise man is warning us here that uh, <clears throat> fearful control is counterproductive. He said, if the clouds are full, they'll empty themselves and there's nothing you're going to do about it. Praise God. And if the tree falls toward the north, if the tree falls toward the south, there shall it be. <clears throat> and what you going to say about it? It's just there's some things that are going to be that way. Just, just go with it, praise. Trust it to God. And... Uh, uh, you're, you're not going to make it happen. Amen. Trust it to God. Hallelujah. In 1981, Dr. Roger Sperry received a Nobel Prize uh, because that he offered the theory which people accepted of the two hemispheres of the mind. The left hemisphere, logical, cold, calculating, and observant, and judgmental. The right hemisphere, intuitive and... Uh, uh, creative, uh, capable of living in awe and in wonder. And industry has accepted that. And industry says simply let the system happen or go with the flow. And because there's something more than cold logic to this world. Praise God. You know, one of the first times that I really began to trust God to something that, that uh, things that I couldn't help. I was pastoring at that time in Port Arthur, and it was in 19, and uh, around 1953, and I poured out myself, and uh, I just uh, felt like that everything depended on just exactly on myself, and I, uh, I just worked awfully hard. North of Kinder, Louisiana, on our way to West Monroe, to the marriage of V. Arlen Gidrose and Robbie Fuller, the, an old song came on the radio. So old now, and most of the folks here would not recognize it. In Sadao, Sadao, Sadao. Whatever will be, will be. The future's not mine, you see. In Sadao, Sadao. Trust it to God. Praise God. What you can, you, you're not going to help some things. You just commit it to Him. I feel like that to some people here today that there is a certain peace that God wants to bring to somebody. To rest in God, praise God. To rest in God. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Brother Von Martin preaching for me one time, sitting at the breakfast table one morning, was talking about life and some of the things of life. Brother Von Martin had gone through a deep, deep, dark valley. He was still in it. He said, I preached for Brother Ike Terry. He helped me a lot. We got up from the breakfast table just like we're eating here. He said, come, come away. I'll show you something. Walked out the back. We went to the um, back gate. By the back gate, there was some roses. Brother Ike Terry reached in his pocket, got out of his pocket, and I clipped off uh, a uh, rose. It was budding. And... 
he handed it to me and he said to me, he said, Vaughn, said, open it. He said, what? said, open the rose. And I took it and I hesitated. He said, open it. And I pulled at the petals. I broke them, I pulled them, I tore them, and I bruised them. And finally, he reached over and clipped another one. And it was a full open rose. And he held it to me and said, I want to show you something here. said, this rose here is uh, unfolded. And it unfolded. And it unfolded. And do you notice how the per petals turned out in the place and everything was fine? He said, you, you tried to open it. And you didn't open it. But he said, the Lord wants you to simply let it unfold. Praise God. Just let it open. Praise the Lord. God is saying here today to this great movement and surge that is in the world today, and the things that are happening here, for people like myself that have sat here and been, been so, so inspired, so intimidated, so flattened, but to say, i got a long way to go, man. i got a long way to go. Praise God. But there's some things I can do. There are some things I can say. There are some places I can fill. And God needs us all. Praise the Lord. Every one of us, thank God. Hey! And to that young preacher that will be here today, that you think that you're going to you take your ministry and you're going to butt it through and you're going to make it and you're going to make it happen and you're going to connive it into place and so on. It's not, my friend, to what comes out from between your ears. It's what's in your heart and it's the power and the presence of God that is flowing through us that makes the difference. Praise God. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. It was cold left brain logic that Judas had. And he put the price on it. He said 300 pence is what it would bring. And so on. And so he applied it. And to Mary, there was no left brain. It was all right brain. The tears, the, the weeping, the drying of the Lord's feet with her hair. Praise God. The flowing of love. Amen. When Sister Freeman came back from Africa on her first uh, furlough, had to travel by boat then. When she got back home, she told this story. She said, I prayed much in my room. And I said, God, I will be visiting the churches of America. What, shall I, what kind of a spiritual posture should I have when I come to them? And as I prayed, she said, I found myself in a city of America, and it was Sunday morning, and I was on my way to church. But as I looked down the sidewalk on my way to church, I saw a tumbling liquid river of light that was rushing toward me. I hesitated, but I went forward and I stepped into it, and it was all so wonderful and it flowed around me, and I followed it. And I thought, where is this coming from? And I followed that river until I saw it tumbling out of a Pentecostal church where I was to be, pouring and gushing down the street and flooding out into the city. I washed up the steps through this liquid light. And I stepped in at the door and the people worshipped. And over each worshiper, there was the miniature waterfall of divine energy that was pouring. And then the man behind the pulpit, there was a great cascade of liquid light that was pouring down through him. Praise God. And I never forgot that. And it wasn't long after that that Brother Drost, now dead, said, I was so drastically sick in Columbia. I knew that I needed to go and pray in the altar. I had not been able to minister that night. The altar was filled. And I finally I dragged myself up. I had a high fever. I draped myself over the altar. I heard a Colombian girl praying right down at the end of the altar. And I thought if somebody would just encourage her a bit, she would receive the Holy Ghost. And then I 
drag myself down to try to help her. But just as I got to her, the baptism of the Holy Ghost came upon her and she began to speak with tongues. Praise God. And he said to me, he said the most wonderful thing, this Colombian girl, which I knew personally, and I knew that she did not know English. And she was speaking in English. And she was speaking it out. And at once my question was, what was she saying? I wanted to know what a person said when they received the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And he said she was saying and praying this, rivers of love are flowing through me. Rivers of love are flowing through me. All right. Hallelujah. Whatever problem that might be in the church of God here today, however personal it may be, however bruising it may be, there is nothing, my friend, that can stand before flowing, real, honest-to-God love. Praise God. Presence of God flowing out. Presence of God doing its work. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Praise God. I want to close here in saying this today. Just give a little testimony. What I'm saying today, I know, I know it works. The wise men said, If you cast your bread upon the water, after many days it shall return to you. In the 19th chapter of Matthew, Jesus spoke to a man who couldn't turn it loose. And he turned away sorrowful. <clears throat> and after he left, Jesus, in effect, said this, the return, if he could have turned it loose, it would have come back, and he gave the figure of 100%. He would have gotten it back. And he said that. And he spoke in terms of thrones that was involved. If a person could trust it to God and believe God for it. It's a principle that works. God believed in it. And though being in the form of God, thought himself not robbery to be equal with God, but he emptied himself. He emptied himself. He gave it. Thank God. And, and he received it back. I began preaching when I was 17 and I didn't have, of course, a place to preach and I was still in Bible school. I didn't know where to go to preach. We preached when we could on street corners and whatnot in towns that we hitchhiked through. But somebody came in one day and they'd been hitchhiking and they'd stopped by Eastland which was 45 miles away from the Bible school and said, something happened to me today. What's that? Well, I stopped by, and I needed a haircut, and I went into a barbershop in Eastland, and I got a haircut. I got to talking to the barber. He is a Baptist uh, a fellow that uh, was concerned about not having any Sunday school in his location for the kids. So he has been getting some folks together for Sunday school. So that, in praying, that clicked with me. I didn't have a car... I hitchhiked over that 45 miles and I got up uh, to Eastland and he described where the barbershop was and so I went to that barbershop. Described the barber to me and I waited. When he got free, I, I moved over and sat down beside him. I said, you're Mr. So-and-so. Yes, uh, I understand that you got a Sunday school going at a uh, uh, little place out 15 miles from uh, Eastland, Texas, Grapevine, that was a long time ago, 50-something years ago. I don't know whether they still call it that now or not. But I said, uh, he said, yeah, we, we, uh, I just was anxious, concerned, because we don't have a church out there, and our kids are not in Sunday school. And so I said, do you need a preacher? And uh, <clears throat> he said, what? I said, do you need a preacher? He said, what do you ask? It? I said, I'm a preacher. He looked at me, and he was a 17-year-old kid, you know it. And uh, he said, uh, he said, you're a preacher? I said, yeah. I said, uh, I'd be very happy to preach for you. And uh, so he said, well, I don't know about that. And he said, uh, 
uh, said, come back by. So after a while, I dropped back by the barber shop. And, and so he came and sat down beside me. He said, you got a car? I said, no, I don't have a car. He said, how would you get over here? I said, I hitchhiked. He said, well, look, I live 15 miles out in the country. And uh, he said, that, I don't know about that. So after a while, he said, say, I'll tell you what. If you'll come in here next Saturday, hang around. When I finish cutting hair, I'll tell you what, I'll take you home with me. And uh, 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 you can stay at our house and come back in Monday when I come back in to cut uh, hair. I said, okay. And so I went out to his house. He had a little farm out there. And, and um, in time, I, I knew that I'd take a change of clothes. I'd milk his cows. I would uh, do what I could around the place and, and help sweep out the old, the old uh, church ha- uh, schoolhouse where he was having Sunday school. And so we did that. We, uh, <clears throat> we got up to a tennis of 40-something, I think. And, well, how, how much good did you do? I don't know. It was just a matter of throwing the bread on the water. It was doing what I could. It was believing that God did call me and that, uh, that I should do what I could do. Praise God. Let it go. Let it go. Praise God. That uh, summer, school was out. <clears throat> so I, I got me a job. I got me a job with a, a man that had an agency to Johnson Motor Lines, Cisco, Texas. I didn't have a place to stay, but he said, there's a cot in there. It's in the bathroom. The bathroom was just walled off there and had one commode and a cold water spigot. And, and then my cot was there in the bathroom, the stinking place, and, and 16 penny nails for you to hang your clothes on. And, and uh, so uh, uh, I hung what few clothes I had up there on those 16 penny nails. <laughs> and the big trucks coming up to the wharf from Dallas and and discharging their stuff and all the racket at night, and knowing that I had to wrestle that stuff around and deliver it next day, and rats all over the place. And uh, one night in that hot place, I dreamed a dream. And uh, I dreamed that I saw a woman, a beautiful woman, a little blonde-headed girl beside her. She had a baby in her arms, she was standing on the porch of a house that had paint on it. I'd never lived in a house that had paint on it in my life. And, uh, and there was a, a, a driveway there. It had a car in it. And that car was my car. And uh, there was the house I was living in. A family. A pretty wife. And, uh, and <clears throat> the next day, after I got a little spot, and I went by a greasy spoon place for get a little something to eat. It was hot. They had these big old uh, airplane fans. That boo, and they just blow everything off. They were hard on flies. That was one good thing about them. And uh, <clears throat> they, uh, I was sitting there and, and uh, getting a little something to eat. And I happened to th- think of that dream. A, a house, a car, a beautiful wife, kids, family. Man, I hadn't had a family since I was 13. And I, a big lump came up in my throat. And the years passed. And keep on throwing it out there. And doing what you could. And, and no place too little to preach. And preached a lot of times to two people. And, and, and just uh, uh, throwing it out there. Praise God. And it was Easter morning, years later, and I was anxious to get to church because we'd made a push, and I was a young preacher and pastor and doing the best, and, and we just thought we had everything, all the bases covered, but you can't be sure. Get down there and check it all out, you know, and, and so on. And, and so I backed the car out uh, in the driveway for me handier for my wife, and so I was waiting, and then the back door opened, and my wife came out. And um, so I said, wait, wait, let me get your picture. 
I had the camera because we were going to take some pictures. And I pulled that camera up and I focused on my wife. And she was standing there and, and our little blonde-headed girl was standing beside her and she had Terry in her arms. And I looked through the lens. Oh, there's that woman. Praise God. It will return. It will return. I know that. I know that. Praise God. Praise God. God bless you. I appreciate so much what happens here. What's going on. appreciate so much this church. Brother and Sister G.A. Mangan, my dear friends of long standing, and Brother Anthony. And I love you, and I appreciate you. God bless you. Amen.